Hi, I'm Linda, and this is No Frills ASMR. So I thought today we could talk casually about the World War II victory plan. And if you know what that means, then you probably know a lot about it and know that it's a giant subject. <laughs> I think Ken Burns did a documentary on it and they usually last 20 hours and I haven't seen that documentary. So, so we're not going to go into everything, but I have an interest in it because I, what I do for part of my job is work on old machines like typewriters, also electronics like radios, um, things of that nature. And I try to date them. And typewriters, like Royal Typewriter, they a lot of times will have dates that run up to about 1942 and then have a gap until 1945-ish. And that's because... they were stopped making them during World War II. So that was one thing. And then my father-in-law, who's in his 90s now, was telling a story about how he grew up in Tennessee and his mother got a job in Detroit um, because times were tough. It was during you know, after the Great Depression, but people were struggling to find work and money. And um, so she got a job in Detroit at a vacuum cleaner company called Eureka. And Eureka Vacuums were um, kind of doing pretty poorly after the Depression, and they had door-to-door -door salesmen, but nobody had money to buy them. So they were about to go out of business. And then World War II happened, and they had the opportunity to start making production for the war. So they completely changed their factory. And instead of making vacuum cleaners, they started to make gas masks. And so his mom went to work for that company making gas masks. And his dad was too young to go to war. He was only like, I think, 11 maybe years old. So he went and stayed in Detroit. His brother and sister, they both went. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting and sort of led me on a little journey <laughs> to look up, you know, what different companies did during the war. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I'm thinking because this, I'm sort of just going with the flow on this video. <laughs> Um, that I looked up some, but it's, it's, you can't, I had trouble finding a resource that just told you what every company did during the war. I had to look up individual companies and see if they switched over production. And so you have to know what company, you know, you're looking up. <laughs> so my hope is because I feel like this channel for me is a, um, place to become curious about information and hopefully learn some new things or refresh your memory, but also to share information. And I found that on my older videos, so many people have shared really, really interesting facts and information. And I'm hoping with this video that people will know like from maybe their grandparents working somewhere or their hometown business switched over completely to manufacture something, you know, for the war. And I just think it's interesting. So I would, I, I hope that in the comments, maybe people can share their personal stories about it. Cause I think it's not really out there. Like it's hard to find sometimes that information unless you know the company. Um, so that's what I'm hoping. And to kind of lend to the conversation, I wanted to be able to put all in one video, the soft spoken and the whisper. 
Okay, I should say this is an ASMR style of video. Um, I tend to talk a little quickly sometimes when I get excited, so it's not like a, a super slow ASMR. <laughs> Although I will try to slow down. But so my thinking is I will record. I mean, I'll do this all in one take, so let's go. <laughs> but I'll try to record it with soft spoken. And then I'll put a timestamp and I'll record it in a whisper because I know there are some people who don't like the soft spoken so much. They like the whisper, but I'll put it all in this one video so that in the comments, you know, I don't have two separate videos with separate comments because I think it might be interesting to hear, you know, people who had their hometown or their grandma or their grandpa working, you know, for some company during the war. I think it could be interesting. And I know there are people who are in Britain and Australia and Germany, you know, who may have stories that could be interesting. And let's just make sure everybody is respectful and nice in the comments. I find people are wonderful and just happy to share information. And I find it exciting. And I'd like to, you know, keep it going. <laughs> okay. Wow. Oh, that was a lot. <laughs> So anyway, first off, I just want to show you this beautiful typewriter I've been working on. This is a Royal um, Quiet Deluxe. Uh, I can't remember the year. It's probably a 50, shoot, I don't know, maybe a 57. And it's turquoise. And this is the original paint that they used in the 50s. I love it. It's beautiful. It works like a charm. It's great. Anyway, it's really just here as a prop because I'm not going to do anything with it. <laughs> But someday, if you ever want me to do a video showing it off, telling you about it, I'm happy to do that. Um, it, they're kind of loud for ASMR because they have the bell and tippy tap. But anyway, um, I want to apologize if you hear my kitty cat in the background meowing <laughs> or my husband playing guitar. Anyway, all right. So the victory plan. Um point of the victory plan was Roosevelt wanted a plan not to go into the war defensively because that's kind of what had been happening up to that point. Um, Germany, uh, the Nazi regime in Germany was very offensive and was just taking over Europe. And Roosevelt wanted to go into the war offensively, not defensively. And so he wanted to produce a ton of munitions, tanks, airplanes for the war, an amount that everybody said was impossible, basically. But, you know, that was the game plan. <laughs> so they got together the War Production Board. I am not going to go into all of this because literally you could talk, I could talk for five hours and not cover it all and... I'm no expert. I don't know that. <laughs> I just don't. I'm just giving you sort of a basic idea of what I'm talking about. So the War Production Board, it was like a month after Pearl Harbor. Um, Roosevelt got the okay to start the War Production Board, which raised taxes and sold war bonds and came up with money to basically convert factories into manufacturing for military equipment. And part of why they did that, and this is why I thought they stopped producing typewriters for a while, was because they wanted to use all the metal, you know, to make uh, airplanes and guns and bullets. And so they didn't want metal being used for um, consumers, you know, uh, civilian use. They wanted it all going to military use. <clears throat> so that's, you know, I think that's a fairly basic explanation. It is not fairly, it's basic, but gives you an idea of what I'm talking about. So I'm talking about during World War II, companies that went um, into production of military. All right, let's get rid of this real quick. Or now we can write on this side. Ooh, it's, it's lined even. So the big ones, the ones that, you know, you've probably heard of were the auto industry. So like um, Chrysler... 
Oh, I didn't capitalize. See, now I'm doing weird. I'm doing weird stuff. Cry slur. If I spell stuff wrong, forgive me. <laughs> also, if I write really sloppy, whatever, it's fine. Okay, Chrysler was making fuselages, uh, which, which, in case you don't know, because I didn't know, I had to look. I was like, you know, I've heard that word a lot. I don't really know what it means. <laughs> it's a body of an aircraft. So that they changed over all their manufacturing to that. Um, General Motors was making airplane engines, guns, tanks, trucks. So that's what they were doing. But then Ford, which was sort of like miraculous what Ford did. Ford was making B-24 Liberator bombers. And I read that once they got to full production, they were, <laughs> this is crazy, they were building one B-24 every 63 minutes. They were making so many. <laughs> and before the war started, these companies, I think it's all these companies. I hope I have this fact right. I I don't have notes. I'm kind of winging it. That's part of the low, the uh, no frills. I don't have like a laptop here. <laughs> but anyway, because part of why I'm doing this channel, sorry to go on a tangent. Um, my dad has Alzheimer's. I sometimes have memory issues. So I'm trying to really challenge my memory more often. Um, so that's why I'm trying to like learn things or remind myself of things either way. Okay, so they were making, the year before the war started, I believe they were making 3 million automobiles, civilian automobiles. During the entire time that they were in production for the war, Okay, this one I might have a little bit wrong, but I think they made 135 civilian automobiles. <laughs> so they gave up complete production to make uh, tanks and airplanes and munitions, just whatever they needed for the war. And um, they outdid what Roosevelt, you know, had asked for by uh, quite a bit. Like they just, it was kind of incredible what they did. And I think the um, Axis forces were not expecting it. And like Japan had their companies, Mitsubishi and Kawasaki, they were building things too, but they just didn't have the same setup that the these big companies had. Because these companies had huge, or maybe they built, I, no, I think it, like, I think Ford's was the Willow Run plant that he had for the Model uh, Model T, I think. And he just switched that over to make these bombers. It was such a huge plant. And he, uh, you know, and he already had the, um, oh, shoot, what's the word? Mm, mass production, the, um, see, this is sometimes words don't come to me right off. Anyway, we all know what I'm talking about. Automated, going down the line, <laughs> production line. Mm. But anyway, he had those kind of things set up. And even like the companies that made um, bullets, they, like if you look at photos, and there are photos out there of the plants that Japan had working, they were like using boxes and setting them and then going through and then setting them. In the, in the U.S., and this isn't like a U.S. is so great. I'm just speaking what I <laughs> read. <laughs> okay. Uh, they had a... Um, you know, a, a belt with all the bullets, like on this belt, just ch -ch -ch -ch, and they had people ch -ch 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 working. I mean, they were just pumping out stuff. Okay. So that's, that's the gist of the bigger companies. But what was interesting me was like the Eureka vacuum company. Now wait till you see this. So this is, wow. I don't know if you can tell what that is. <laughs> But this is an upright vacuum, and this is a bullet vacuum with a cord. Anyway, so the Eureka Vacuum Company, the aforementioned that my grandmother-in-law, yeah, was working at, was making gas masks. So they switched over, because they already had filters for the vacuums, they switched over and started producing gas masks and completely stopped making vacuums. Now this company, after... 
the depression was having a very hard time. And I think I maybe already said that, but they were practically on the verge of going out of business. But because of these government contracts and the government sold war bonds and tax and added taxes to pay for all this, they were able to be pay these companies to hire employees and start making gas masks. So not only did it save the company, it also saved a lot of people from, you know, starvation after the Great Depression. Honestly, that's how bad it was. Um, and so it put people to work. So before the war, the unemployment rate was like over 20%. But during the war, it went down to, I think, 1%. Like the only thing stopping America from making more tanks and more of everything, they just didn't have enough workforce. Everybody was working. Children were working. And there's a lot to that, too, because the unions were being, weren't, they weren't allowed to go on strike. You know, things were happening. That's a different video. We're just talking about these companies. Anyway, okay, so Eureka Vacuum went into making gas masks. I thought that was interesting. And I sometimes work on sewing machines. And Singer sewing machines turned over all their production to make guns. So that's interesting. Um, let me see what other one I have that's interesting. Well, Royal Typewriter, which is what kind of partially got me started. They, it's kind of weird because you think, oh, you need typewriters <laughs> during the war. But I think there were already quite a few typewriters out there. And for some reason, I think they were using Smith Corona. I feel like I read that. Um, so Royal switched over their plants to make machine guns, rifles, bullets, propellers, airplane parts. So that's pretty interesting. Um, I don't like the way I have the L written right there. I want an L like that. Uh, there's some barring in capital letters. Sometimes words look spelled wrong to me. But you can see the drawing of the typewriter there. All right, so that's kind of interesting. Um, oh, yeah, this one. Okay, hold on. Let me see my... So Lionel trains, which make the children's train sets, like the kind that you put around your Christmas tree, they stopped all production of children's trains and started making, and I thought this was kind of cool, compasses for warships. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> um, oh yeah, well Kodak. Kodak um, didn't really have to, I don't think they had to change out their manufacturing so much because they still made film and cameras. But they also said they made pontoons and hand grenades. stomach just crawled so bad <laughs> oh sorry I'm not gonna refilm this you guys sorry about that <laughs> it happens okay all right Maytag can you tell what this is it's a washing machine they made clothes washers but Maytag switched over to making aircraft parts so there's another interesting one RCA who made TVs, but actually they also made um, radios and stuff. They switched over to making radios for the military and also radar equipment. Uh, this one isn't as good. This was just an interesting story because I thought, what did the um, guitar manufacturers do? So I looked up Gretsch and Gretsch guitars, they make drums, Gretsch drums too. And basically the government just said, we need all that metal you're using for drums to make you know, weapons and stuff. So you can't make drums anymore. And then, um, so Gretsch was a pretty small, it was in Brooklyn, New York, and it was a small manufacturing. So they just started making, uh, I want to say this correctly, ukuleles. I think that's how you say it. And um, like kind of like toy musical instruments that were mostly just cheaper wood and no metal to send to the troops for entertainment. That was kind of interesting. Um, but <laughs> I don't know why this. Gibson 
they when you look at their history of Gibson on their website, they say they switched to wartime production, but they do not say what they made, which I thought was kind of curious. But then they said that, and I think this is actually on their website's history. They hired, oh my goodness, I think it was like 25,000 women to build guitars while the men were all off at war. And so they were building Gibson guitars but Gibson <laughs> company lied about it and told people they were built by elder uh, men who couldn't go to war, but who were experts in guitar. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> what, what? And that's when I realized it's because people wouldn't like to know women, <laughs> untrained, basically women, not, un but, you know, had built the guitars, even though they any other day would have hired untrained men to build guitars, but there's something about the idea. Women couldn't do it, I guess, but they did. So that was interesting. But I think Gibson has now fessed up to it and said, yeah, yeah, they did. <laughs> During that, if you buy a guitar that came out of that period, a woman built it. Oh my God. So I thought that was interesting. So anyway, these are all that I really looked up. Um, I just thought it was interesting. So that's why I wanted to bring it out here. Oh yeah. This tank just for fun. Look at that. A couple of kinder. Um, and I thought people could, if you had any, uh, um, you know, companies that you know of that you think is a good story, put it in the comments because I'm curious. I'm just curious. And like I said, it's hard to find. Oh, you know what? I should have. I should have looked up a watch company. I wonder if like Timex or Citizen. You know, I don't know which ones are U.S. based. But that could be kind of an interesting one to see what they converted over to. Because I just think, and then I was also wondering about food production. I was trying to look that up, but I didn't really find much. Because um, I know that people, you know, were told to, you know, grow a garden to feed yourself and all that to save everything for the servicemen. Um but anyway, if you have any interesting stories, please share them in the comments. Uh, I think this might seem crazy, but I think I'm going to now switch to Whisper and basically kind of repeat all this information because people want me to do these videos in a Whisper, but I want to keep this all in one video so that the comments are all together. Does that make sense? <laughs> so if you had your fill, then I would head out now. But I will timestamp this. Actually, let me write down the time. And I will um, put it in the little blurb below. And usually, I think you can click right on that timestamp and it'll take you to the spot where it starts. So <clears throat> I'm going to take a drink of water because <laughs> I'll tell you what, whispering's kind of hard. It's hard. It uses a lot of breath. I had no idea until I, <laughs> I haven't whispered since I was a little kid at a sleepover. <laughs> All right, hold on. But I'll switch over now. Okay. Hi, I'm Linda. <laughs> and I'm spelling wrong. No frills ASMR. Okay. I just did a video that was all soft spoken, but I am going to put a timestamp. So you will click to right here. So hello, if you just joined me. <laughs> um, today, I made this video with a soft-spoken voice and whisper, and I'm putting them all together because I'm kind of hoping that in the comments there might be a fun conversation about... Um, about... I feel like I'll give it away if I say... I'll go back to that in a minute, but what we're talking about today is the World War II Victory Plan, which was a um, plan by Roosevelt during World War II to um, turn the companies in the U.S. that were already manufacturing products to change them out to make wartime production munitions and jeeps, guns, you know, tanks, whatever you need to 
fight in a war. And um, Roosevelt was trying to get this done, but it wasn't until after Pearl Harbor that he was able to get the War Production Board. I, I think this is right. My facts right here could be, because I'm just kind of pulling this. I, I read about it, but I'm just remembering it. Um, uh, in nine, it was after World, uh, sorry, Pearl Harbor. Within a month, he was able to get the government to say, yeah, we're going to fund the War Production Board through um, war bonds. And, which, by the way, that could be an interesting subject, war bonds. Anyway, war bonds and um, taxes. And that will use that money to pay the companies to switch from building things for the public to building things for the war effort. And um, the kind of big ones that a lot of people know about are the big car companies, the big three car companies, which we talked about in another video if you're interested. There's a video about Chrysler, GM, and Ford. Although I want to do an updated one on GM because um, I feel like I didn't give it a fair shake. <laughs> I missed, I, I just didn't know much about GM, to be honest. Um, so Chrysler changed over their factories to building fuselages, which at first I said, oh yeah, yeah. And then I realized I really don't even know what a fuselage is, so I'm going to tell you because maybe you're like me and don't know. It's the body of an aircraft. It's like the, you know, main body part. GM switched over to building airplane engines, guns, tanks, trucks, so they made all kinds of things. But the really big one was Ford. And I'm from Detroit, so I'm kind of familiar with these places, but Ford has a plant called the Willow Run plant that was huge, and I think that is where they, I, I, this could be wrong, somebody can say so in the comments, but um, I think that's where they built the Model T, and they switched that over, like, in no time at all, to making the B-24 Liberator bombers, and um, Roosevelt had asked them to make, I don't, even, I don't have these numbers, but a lot of them, <laughs> I want to say 62,000 or something. And everybody said, no way, this is crazy. Well, Ford switched it over, and at the height of their production, I read that they were building one bomber every 63 minutes, and they ended up outproducing that number by like, I don't know, sorry, I should have written down a number, but thousands, thousands more than, than they had requested, you know. Oh, and this is a real good fact. Also, my numbers could be wrong. I wrote these down well from, from my brain, which isn't reliable. But Chrysler, GM, and Ford, before the war, the year before the war, created three million automobiles to sell to the public. During the war effort, when they were all switched over to building munitions and, you know, whatever, they only created, uh, and this is like a four-year period that they did, they only created 135 vehicles. So that just shows, you know, they quit everything. There were no new cars built during that time. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. And that's actually, now see, this is the tricky part about doing a soft spoken and a whisper in a row is I can't remember what I've said already. But I don't think I said this in the whisper one. Um, I work on all sorts of vintage things. And one of those things is typewriters, which is why this is sitting here. I'm not really going to use this today. It's just a prop to show you. But when I look up the dates, and you can by the um, serial number on a typewriter, look it up and usually figure out the date. There's always a gap, a four-year gap during the war. And you just know, oh, well, that was during the war. They didn't create, they didn't, you know, manufacture them. Oh my god, my stomach's crawling, sorry. That happened earlier. <laughs> I'm kind of uh, on a fast right now because I had some stomach trouble. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, what was I saying? The typewriter. Oh yeah, so there's always this wartime gap. And I kind of like didn't really think about it too much at all. I 
sort of assumed it was like they needed the metal for making, you know, parts for the war. But then when I, well, and then my father-in-law um, told a story to us the other day about, and he's like 90, he's actually 92 years old, I think. But when he was a kid, like 11 years old, he was living in Tennessee and his mother um, got a job in Detroit working for Eureka Vacuum Company, but it was during the war and she was making gas masks. So during the time of the war, they lived in Detroit and she worked there making gas masks. And then they moved back to Tennessee and he was too young to go to war at that time. He was a young guy. Um, so I thought that was an interesting story and it led me on this journey of looking up what different companies made during the war. Like, what did they switch their manufacturing to? And my hope is, and the reason I put the soft spoken and whisper video in the same, you know, video is because I'm hoping that if you have a personal story or your town has a story or you know of something, like, it's hard to find what different companies switched over to because there seems to be no master list of this. And I thought it was interesting, but I'd have to go look up. I'd have to think of a company and go, okay, I will look up what they did. I will look up what they did. So if you know of something that you think is interesting, please share it in the comments. I think it might be just fun for us all to see each other's, you know, just, I don't know, just for fun, <laughs> for curiosity's sake. Okay, so I made cute little cards with cute little drawings. So this one is the Eureka, Eureka Vacuum Company, and that is where my grandmother-in-law, is that right? Mm, I think so. Anyway, sh no, grandmother, yeah, that is right. Anyway, she went to there, to Eureka Vacuum in Detroit, and they had filters on these vacuums, so they were able to pretty quickly switch them over to gas masks. So I thought that was kind of cool. And then the Singer Sewing Machine Company, which I sometimes work on sewing machines, so I looked this one up. They switched over to making guns. So for four years, Singer was making guns. And I think that um, it's collectible to, if you find a Singer gun, gun because of that. They went right back to sewing machines, I think, after the war. Um, okay, let me see which one's the next one I want to do. Let's see. This one's kind of neat. So Lionel trains, which are the trains that, you know, people collect, and they're toy trains. They're the little toy train. Well, they're big. They actually, sometimes they're like that. It depends. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> they're the ones you put around your Christmas tree. So Lionel train switched over to making compasses for warships. I thought that was neat. So... Gretsch 
shed and heal out of scratch. And they didn't really, ch well, uh, okay, they made drums, scratch drums, and those are made almost completely out. They had used a lot of metal. They aren't made that, okay, scratch that. They use a lot of metal. So the government was like, no, we need all that metal. You can't make drums, <laughs> but you can make guitars that don't use much metal. So they kind of, this isn't Gibson, this is Scratch. So they switched over to making ukuleles. Am I saying that right? I, I don't know. Ukuleles is how I'm here, you know, but I think I was saying that right. Anyway, um, they switched it over to, uh, you know, like toy guitars that they sent to the military. Oh my god, I smell like they're calling some man. just some that I looked up and it's like I said it's kind of hard to find so I'm hoping that maybe you guys have stories about like places in your hometown like I feel like I remember one time I went on a tour of a sock factory <laughs> of all things in Tennessee and I thought they told me that during the war they switched to making all wool socks that they sent to the military so like stories like that I think could be really interesting and they're hard to find online you know like those smaller that did that kind of thing. And, sorry, I got all excited for a minute. And a lot of these companies were actually saved. I mean, literally, they were going out of business after the Depression and lack of sales. And when the money came in and they were able to build these things, it saved their companies. And, you know, all the work, the, the unemployment rate in the U.S. went from 20% to 1%. So, like, if you weren't working for the military, you were working for some company building things for the military. And it really did help the U.S. have a big boom after the war, you know, because everybody was flush with cash, except the government. <laughs> but they, uh, they recouped a lot of it on war bonds and taxes and things like that. So, I don't know, it's all kind of interesting, and it's way beyond what I could even talk about here. Obviously, it's like huge... <laughs> But I do hope that, you know, maybe people will have stories that are, that we find interesting, or you can go look stuff up if you want on your own. But, you know, I'm no expert, obviously. <laughs> Just curious, curious person. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Uh, I don't think so. I probably missed some things because when you say something, like I did the soft spoken in this, when you say it twice in a row, sometimes you, um, you know, miss things, because <laughs> you can't remember if you already said it. <laughs> anyway, all right, well, I appreciate you guys watching, and I really do appreciate all the very kind comments, and that people share facts without being, you know, rude about it. I think everybody, for the most part, has been really cool, so I do appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Alright, I'll talk to you guys.
guys later.